Welcome to the Focus and Chill podcast, where we discuss productivity tactics that work for neurodivergent individuals. Every episode, we interview guests with lived experience of neurodiversity who also have a solid productivity and habit game, and pass the learnings on to you, our wise and benevolent audience. We're your hosts, Jeremy and Joey. I'm Joey, and I coach creatives to get moving on their most ambitious projects through the power of solid habits and strong focus. I'm also a perpetual student of psychology and perpetually on a quest to a one-armed chin-up. And I'm Jeremy, a neurospicy software developer turned startup founder, building the Focus Bear app to help people with ADHD and autism thrive at work. My cool party trick is leaving parties early so I can get to sleep in time for my two hour long morning routine. The Focus and Chill podcast is brought to you by Focus Bear, a habit and productivity app that makes healthy habits and deep work the path of least resistance. If you have a tendency to check emails or scroll through Instagram first thing in the morning, but long to develop a meditation and exercise habit first thing, Focus Bear can help you. The app blocks distractions on all your devices and guides you through your habits one at a time. Throughout the day, Focus Bear assists you to stay in deep work by blocking websites and apps that are unrelated to your chosen focus mode. Life's not all about work though. You'll be prompted to take regular breaks to rest your eyes and stretch your muscles. At the end of the day, Focus Bear helps you switch off. Work-related apps get hidden so you can unwind and sleep well. Check out the app by going to focusbear.io. Welcome to episode number 44 of the Focus and Chill podcast. Our guest today is Lauren Petrullo. Lauren is a former Disney innovation catalyst, now turned social commerce specialist and multi-founder. She is a 33-year-old self-made CEO that specializes in marketing, e-commerce, and loves to disrupt. She's found new ways to blaze the trail in remote workplaces, as well as being the proud founder of the most inclusive beauty brand online, all while promoting clean drinking water initiatives overseas. From speaking fluent Italian, learning three Asian languages simultaneously, and having just finished her first improv class, she's all over the map in a great way. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, really looking forward to finding out about some of the things you're doing. Let's start out with your journey with ADHD. I believe it started very early on. Yeah, so um, I was actually diagnosed when I was nine or 10 years old um, with ADD and ADHD. Um, Both myself and my younger brother were prescribed Adderall and Ritalin at the time. Um, I have always been... uh, known as one of the most energetic humans in the room, uh, so much so that uh, most people uh, claim that they can't keep up with me, uh, which I think is like a continued element to the ADHD. But um, my younger brother, he actually suffered from it in an even more extreme capacity where uh, it was highly recommended that I get medicated while in school. And it was a requirement for him to return back to the school that we were at. So that was interesting, uh, quick learn into this, like granted I'm 33, was born in 1989. So this was like, you know, when Hercules had come out, like between Hercules and like Lilo and Stitch era. I remember that. Yeah. Just to give those listeners context of how it was, um, really not as common as it had become when I had gone to college where it felt like everyone was familiar with what it was. But um, yeah, it was a, you're expected to take this pill every day for the rest of your life if you'd like to continue to be in the classroom kind of conversation. That sounds, I mean, in some ways, was it helpful? But at the same time, mm-hmm. it, it sounds pretty paternalistic almost that that would require <laughs> you to do that. Um, I will say that my younger brother's energy levels, like it was uh, more perceived as a disruptive kind Mm. of uh, piece to the classroom. Um, My my struggles with it was uh, it became evident when uh, I wasn't paying attention in class and um, I was less as a disruption to my classmates as I was more of an obviously distracted individual and the teachers didn't understand why I wasn't focusing, but it hadn't been a problem because my grades and my work hadn't suffered in any way whatsoever, but other parents, the teacher, other students, 
uh, we're in this situation where it's like, well, why, why does she get to goof off or why is she standing or why are the various different components? Like I was running around like 10 miles an hour and, um, no matter how many sports my mom would throw me in, like I couldn't get tuckered out. So it was just, it was a twofold kind of situation where it seemed like something was wrong with me. Not only did it feel like something was wrong with me, but like something had to be fixed. And so it was like this medicine that I had to take. And I remember um, like, you know, the, the film uh, where it was with, oh, what's his name? Bradley Cooper. And he took those, those pills to become like his super self. That wasn't um, the opinion I had. It just, it almost felt like I was becoming less than myself. And I remember like there's appetite suppression. Um, there's a lot more moodiness to it. And I just recognize myself. Like I was looking out, examining myself and feeling like I was less than like a, almost like a shadow of who I was. And, um, I found my teacher and my friend's parents, uh, feeling more comfortable around me. Um, so it was just a, a reckoning and understanding of who I was and where I fit in the various environments that I found myself in because I had now this definition of what was acceptable as who I can present myself as and what was deemed as uh, not normal, which in my opinion only should be used on a washing machine and not as a label <laughs> to any human being, but mm. yeah. Yeah, that sounds unfortunate that you were expected to conform to, to be more palatable for other people, but it actually made you feel worse. Um, I think uh, it could have made me feel worse. Um, I want to recognize that like my mom, father, and like even my siblings, uh, when this was a conversation of, hey, why, why am I now able to go spend the night? Whereas before it was like, hey, you know, Lauren should not spend the night with our friends kind of situation. Um, in my household, we had a lot of emotional support of discussing this kind of scenario. So where I think maybe some people listening would feel that that's a really like looking back, that could have been a way worse situation to be in. But in my household, it was never deemed as anything other than this is what the school is regulating. If you don't want to take it, you don't have to. But you have to understand that you're going to have to taper down your excitement, your reactions and um, sharing when you finish stuff early or different elements that gave someone the opportunity to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's ADD, that's ADHD. It almost became like this switching element. And so in my household, it was you be whoever you want to be with us always and forever. Um, and then let's bring up different times where it feels like you're being less than yourself. Why do you feel like you're being less than yourself? And how can you maintain your true self identity um, on or off the medicine? Because I, I was given the opportunity to uh, not take it as in like my parents caught me stop taking it. And then it was just a, like, it became a at home practice and, um, a like once or twice a week thing. Whereas I was just like, good. If it, maybe that's why I love improv. Cause I was improving already at a young age of like, yeah, I took the medicine. Cause if I told my teachers I had taken it, they couldn't tell me I couldn't be in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then were you essentially having to mask then and pretend that you were chill and, and calm? It was more like, like my parents would teach me like different techniques, like when I was sitting down um, so that I wouldn't like immediately want to stand or like move around a lot. Um, I had my mom move me to different parts of the classroom because when I would sit up front, I would finish all my work really quickly. I would ask lots of questions. It was super obvious when I was up front in the classroom that I had finished my stuff, that I was already engaging on a thousand other different things. And it became a distraction for the rest of my classmates. Um, so it was, yeah, this way to like hide it, mask it in a way. Um, and then also like really importantly is my family said like, that doesn't have to be the defining moment for you. Um, and that really picked up in conversations when I was in high school. Um, and especially in college. So I went to the public school system in high school. And so it wasn't as pervasive as it was at university where it seemed like having ADD, having ADHD, like having that prescription became like a, oh, I need this um, no longer to conform, but I need this to meet standard expectations. Mm. People using it as a smart drug. Yes. Mm. 
That's really interesting about the coping strategies that you had in the, the classroom. Because mm. it, it sounds like the work was too easy and that was part of it. Do you, do you think there were problems just with the school environment that it, it assumes everyone will go at the same pace, whereas mm. you were able to finish your work really quickly? Uh, yes, I think there is a degree of that. Um, you know, it's hard to maintain simulation. Like I was in a private school. Um, at this age, like I went to Catholic school. So we had smaller classrooms. Um, I just think that growing up in a, in a busy household and then being on two or three different sports at the same time and doing multiple practices a day, um, I was accustomed to better time management skills than maybe my other peers. Um, you know, if you wanted to use the one shower, you, you had to plan your day. So I think, um, it was partially perhaps that there were opportunities to be more challenged in the classroom, but I think also I just had a greater exposure and affinity to com project completion at a younger age. Um, and, uh, part of that was, okay, I want to be mindful of like that, that focus element where, uh, if, if you had my attention on something, you had my commanded attention, like to almost to an obsessive kind of component. Um, and I would just do whatever I could to finish it. Cause I had already moved on in my head. And, um, when I was on medication, uh, I just became like, almost like Charlie Brown and you have the want, 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 like the noises that are all around you of what would be distracting. Like they had just become like in audible places and my reaction time had become significantly impacted, um, which is where in the classroom, I hated the, like, I could see how long it took for my hand to raise. And I'm a competitive person and I wanted to have the right answer first. So, mm. Do you mean, did it also affect you at sport then with reaction time? Yeah. So that was the main reason I stopped taking it. So I was playing soccer and I was playing soccer with the guys. I was like one of two girls on the, the soccer team. And like, it was really just, it was terrible. Like I had to be aware of all the different things going on in the field. And what I thought was a superpower who I was naturally, um, lent into me being able to compete. And I remember, oh my goodness, I'm not going to say his name, but his initials PK had said, wow. Oh, Lauren's playing like a girl. And I was like, whoa, what? Because I knew who the other girls and the references that they were making. And I was furious. So that's what prompted the conversation with my family of, I, I can't do this and still play soccer with the guys. Mm. Do you think the dosage wasn't right? Maybe that it was having those kind of effects? Um, we, we explored a lot of different dosages um, and then also different time releases of the medicine. Um, I think in my household because of the extreme ADHD that my younger brother had where um, he like ended up, they wouldn't let him back into the school we were attending until the dosage was adjusted. Um, his ADHD had taken the focal point, um, but there were definitely some poor dosage choices I had taken. Um, there were some like mood issues. Like um, I, I can't say this with certainty or anything of that nature, but remembering like these different like lower points, I hadn't felt as much sadness in different areas because of like when the dispersion. So the really long time releases were not great for me. And I'd find myself in this kind of spiral emotionally. And um, while I got into at that time, what felt like really depressive states and like, you know, a few years later, I even had like an attempt to just stop everything that was going on in my life. Thank God it failed. Way to go, Ashley. I appreciate you. Um, but there, there was just like this really like mood shifts that were much larger than what I had been pressed, like had experienced before. But I was also like a growing girl. So that could have been normal. Like I don't have a control of myself. Yeah. And I did feel that the dosage experimentations were the worst experience because it was just such. Mm. versions of myself yeah I'm sorry that happened it sounds like it was quite unpleasant oh there are worse things in life like it was okay like I had a support system 
Um, and also like, you know, at the time it didn't feel dramatic. Looking back, I was like, wow, my world, I was so small understanding of how much greater life is. Like you'll see my dog walking by. He's the cutest mm-hmm. thing in the world. Yep. <laughs> Great to have an extra guest as well. Yeah. So when you I, you had started talking about college and high school, yeah. did it basically get better at that point? Um, after middle school, I did go to high school early. So I went to this school in Chicago where I enrolled in high school at seventh grade. Um, the teachers had offered me to skip seventh grade or, um, and so I just went to high school where it was like a mixed program and, um, that high school was significantly more challenging in high school. I was significantly more challenged, um, in my academic career. And then I went to college and played soccer at the university level. And because I chose a school for sports versus academics, I found myself again in a place where I was less challenged. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm mindful of um, those outside factors that can influence my personal experience. But I did find out in college how often and how frequently other people in my dorm or other people in my classes would be like, oh, you have this magical prescription? Oh my gosh, it's finals times. It's crunch times. Do you know anyone with a pill bottle? And I was, I was shook. I was not prepared for how normalized it had become to have access to a drug, which had felt ostracizing um, when I was younger. That's interesting. The the way that the stigma shifted, that did the other kids realize when you were younger and then at, in college, it was like, Hey, can you get me some of that stuff? It was Yeah. Like the juxtaposition of like, Oh yeah. Like she has to be medicated. Like she has to calm down versus mm. the, she has what we need. I was like, mm. this is a 10 year pivot. Like, I don't know what happened. Um, but it, it did, um, again, expose me to a different perspective on the matter. And I will say, um, having been diagnosed, going through the various different, um, brand names and the non-brand names and the different dosages and all that jazz, as well as seeing my brother with on a spectrum of large to small amounts of what your impact for ADHD was like, he was he was at the extreme levels. Like it was like fun story about my younger brother. Um, he asked for like gardening shears for his like seventh birthday. And then he went and like pruned our mom's like cherry blossom tree in the front yard. Mm-hmm. Cause he was just like, he couldn't stop staring at it. He's like, this needs to be fixed. Like it was just wildness. Um, <laughs> if you met him now, you would never, ever believe that that was his personality growing up. Um, but it was just watching how commercialized it had become watching how like insignificant and like, this is just a smart pill just at like using the word just, um, it felt destabilizing to how much at times we did need the medicine. Like I did avoid taking the medicine instead of every day I was taking like one or two days a week at least. Whereas my brother was on it every single day. Like there, there had to be moments where it's like, if we didn't take the medicine, like it became disruptive and challenging to like ourselves as people. So as much as like, it was great, like, oh, we talked about it and tried all these different techniques. Um, no, we still, still required the medicine for like a functioning little human kind of piece. And so it felt like it was like trivialized and I hated that. Shame when it's treated that way. And I think you were saying that there's potentially now with all the publicity that ADHD has that it that might be being trivialized further? Um, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, I know that like neurodivergence and other elements um, have become for some people a label of a crutch, which is what I felt was happening in at least in my college experience that um, I couldn't be considered intelligent because I was intelligent. Um, I had this like chip on my shoulder or something that was, you know, spearheading my success in college with relation to how much time I spent on work compared to other individuals I knew. Um, 
because of this medicine. Um, and when someone took the medicine without the prescription, they're like, see, I'm much better of myself. Therefore, I know that in your experience, it dictates your ability to complete your homework or to do, to be more productive. Um, and so now it does feel like a little bit of a pendulum swing where, um, neurodivergence is a sexy term, uh, that adds mass appeal, um, as well as, forgive me for saying this, like a participation trophy award a bit of, um, yes, I am also on this. So please cater to my needs. Now there are a hundred percent individuals that do live on a neurodivergent spectrum, but I think there are others that are leaning into it because it's easy and because they can, um, and it's not as regulated as a space. Hmm. Yeah, it's tricky because I, I guess there's been a lot of underdiagnosis in the past, mm. but it, we don't want it to swing the other way and have everyone being grouped into that that same sector when the, there's probably, I guess, what you were talking about earlier that around the spectrum of severity that your brother's on one massive end of the spectrum and then the other students who just wanted to take the the pills to help them with the final study they're probably on the the far left end of it oh they're they're so far left like i wouldn't even put them on the line it was just a like i mean i think it would lend itself to people are looking for like biohacking yep <laughs> stuff. and like there are solutions like there are different types of like lion's mane mushrooms and other supplements that can facilitate that type of biohacking um but i know at least in the united states it's really easy to find a single pill solution versus looking at the long-term growth which is what i think i'm really lucky with growing up in my household again like those techniques that we would practice the conversations we would have were for long-term impact they weren't immediate i mean i didn't go from being diagnosed and being on a strong dosage like i think at the end i was down to like 75 milligrams a day, but like I had a strong dosage and it was like weaned back over time, like three, four years to get to the place where it was like a one today. I would most likely describe it as for anyone that wears contacts. A lot of people wear contacts and the doctor says, you know, wear your, your contacts during the day, make sure you wear your glasses at night. But really some people that are like avid contact wearers will wear their glasses maybe one day a week, maybe two days a week. That's how I had been able to adapt for the medicine that we had eventually focused my um, dosage on. And then just by nature of being a teenager, I sometimes like forgot. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably the most powerful way to do it, to have the behavioral changes in conjunction with medication as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be keen to talk further about some of the strategies you use. Let's move on, though, fast forwarding to today. What type of work projects are you concentrating on? You've got a, a few, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, there's uh, an element to uh, owning several different companies and founding a lot. Um, I, I know when a lot of people look at like what I focus on for work specifically, it's like, I can't keep up with you. Like, it seems like you're starting a new company all the time or, um, your, your hands are in so many different baskets. Um, I have found success at least with, um, making sure that if I'm going to have split attention or if I'm going to not be able to focus, like I'm not the person that will become a piano master and put in the 10,000 hours and only do this. Um, I have a lot of different um, spigots in the fire because um, I have found success at least. If something is affecting here, it might also affect here and rising tides lift the boats. Um, so right now I've got a digital marketing agency where I've got an amazing um, group of over 30 humans that just uh, let me delegate <laughs> as much as possible so I can sound like I'm super busy and then just delegate it left and right. I'm like, Oh yeah, this is a shiny object. I give it to you. Oh, now I give it to you. I feel like, um, an expo chef in a kitchen with the marketing agency. 
Um, and then I've also, um, I am the founder of Asian Beauty Essentials, which is an e-commerce brand where we sell Asian beauty products from Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and more. Um, and uh, it's so different from the agency, but in the si same vein, it's similar because we work with so many e-commerce brands at Mongoose Media, the agency, uh, that now I get to see the other side of the conversation. Granted, I do. I am a founder, co-owner in uh, a swimsuit brand for babies and a matcha brand in the U.S. Um, but the Asian Beauty Essentials, because it's only mine, I get to like find a thousand different ways to focus on the same project. Like the closest I have to focusing on the piano. So it's like what I'm working on is um, how are we uh, developing our in-person presence? Like, are we showing up at conventions? Uh, what does our um, different content look like to the English and Spanish speaker in the United States? Uh, what does our newsletter element look like? How do we drive external traffic from various sources? Like it's all roads are leading to Rome for like Asian beauty essentials, but I'm like, choosing different tracks and uh it's been so much fun like honestly I'm super grateful to live with ADHD because it's not that I pick up something and I walk away I get to like pepper something and then focus on another element repepper some ideas to it come back to it and then um I'm really fortunate because I have a team where they can like I pollinated almost, and then they let that garden grow. And then I can come back and continue to pollinate. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I can see how they all connect together, <laughs> that the ideas from the, from Mongoose Media feed into what you're doing then with Asian Beauty Essentials and probably with the other yeah. brands too. And I, I love yeah. being able to have a team. I want to, in the, a later question about optimizing your productivity, I want to ask about how you work with Claire around your calendar and some of the other yeah. tactics that I've observed. But let's, <laughs> before we get to that, let's talk about, I guess, maybe feeding into Asian beauty essentials. You're learning three different Asian languages. Are they Japanese, yeah. Korean, and what's the third one? Mandarin. All right. Fun yeah. uh -huh. Ah, Li Hai. Mm, what the cheese of Shijongo and my wife is from China so I have had to learn a bit of Mandarin to speak to her parents well I'm impressed uh I would say soybeanyi means um whatever you choose <laughs> that would be like the best one what would you like to eat soybeanyi mm. <laughs> whatever you choose I'm flexible mm. um wow that's so cool um well well done how are you uh, learning yours I, uh, okay. So there's a few apps that I found, um, that I've really liked. Um, so for Korean specifically, there's an app called talk to me in Korean. They also have a collection of YouTube videos, but their app arranges all these podcasts into like an audio textbook that if anyone has difficulty learning languages and like you get overwhelmed and distracted, and then like you like get into this place of like, Oh, I don't know how to pass go or collect $200 for Korean specifically, T-T-M-I-K. Talk to me in Korean is a fabulous one. Um, I also uh, found in-person classes in Orlando where I live, um, where the classes are less than $5 an hour for Korean and Chinese. Um, wow. So I'm able to attend those on the weekends. I know if you, um, again, specifically on the Korean side, I found it because it's almost like a church recruitment tactic. Like, Full disclosure. Oh, okay. <laughs> the you same way they go do to our church. Classes. Yeah, exactly. You <laughs> want to go to church, take, you know, dollar an hour Korean classes. Oh, by the way, you want to practice listening, reading, and hearing Korean, attend service. It's all in Korean. Hmm. Um, yeah. And then, like, of course, Duolingo. I mean, I'm a very competitive person. I get to see all my uh -huh. friends. And I'm like, oh, let's high five this, this milestone together. Um, and then also I highly recommend if, if you are getting like more interested and serious in your language development, um, I talkie, I T A L K I, you have the ability to meet with teachers on zoom and you have tutors from four to $40 an hour that can help meet you where you are in your language learning skills. And a lot of, um, language adaption for me is just pure immersion and conversation. Like if I'm not going to use it like a textbook, 
you know, like, donde está el baño? Where's the bathroom in Spanish? Like, I'm not usually asking that. Like, if I really need another restroom, you see my like pee pee dance or whatever. <laughs> um, but Italki is a really great place where you get to meet individuals that are passionate about their culture, their language, um, and do that type of exchange. So those are my like three main resources. I mean, I have a whole bunch more, but like, mm. I can't recommend those services enough. Those apps. Nice. Do you still play a lot of sport as well? <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, when I was 16, I gave up boredom. Like that was my New Year's resolution. Um, so, uh, right now I am a competitive dragon boater. Uh, you having a wife from China, I'm sure you're familiar with the sport of dragon boating. I haven't actually ever watched it, but I, I know what it is. <laughs> For shame. <laughs> I won't judge you. So you're much. in the really, the, the long 16 per person boat. Uh, 20 of us are paddling side by side with a nice. steersman and a drummer. So I describe it as competitive canoeing, but Chinese with 20 people in a boat. And I say Chinese because I'm on a Chinese team in the United States, like in Florida, um, which I was recruited to from my Chinese class. Like they literally walked up to me, checked out my arm with and <laughs> said, you need to join. I didn't know what the sport was, but I said, okay. Um, I fence and I Zumba and I yoga. I'm not very good at the Zumba, but I am an ego boost to all of the talented Dominican and Brazilian women in my classes. <laughs> not much soccer anymore? Um, no, I played soccer in college. Um, so again, I chose the school um, to play at the highest level and loved it. Uh, but it is a contact sport and um I fixed my one shoulder, but as soon as this one was fixed, the right one popped out. And so my right shoulder is dislocated like Ooh. at least 200 times. I stick to chill sports now. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned that your morning routine involves K-pop dancing. Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> it totally does. Okay, so I'm, I'm a firm believer that like how you start your day defines your day. Um, and so my best days are always when I follow my routine of, um, having my very specific beverage, whether it's like a protein drink or a matcha beverage. Um, and then doing like 15 minutes of Duolingo, 15 minutes of reading and 15 minutes of glistening. And I say glistening because it's just like getting a little bit of a sweat that I start to sparkle. Um, and the way I do that is like, I'll either use the quest and play beat saber, but more often than not, I'll do like mirrored K-pop dancing. It's, it's <laughs> funny. Thank goodness no one's up at like five in the morning. So it'd be humiliating to see how off I am. But like, they're fun. I enjoy <laughs> it. I'm not a big K-pop person, but I am here for these dance routines. <laughs> I love it. I I do that sometimes as well. There's a, a dance track in Beachbody, this workout app, and I quite enjoy doing some of them. <laughs> Tell me about your calendar management solution, potentially someone ah. named Claire. <laughs> Fair. So actually it's two, it's Claire and Irish. Um, mm. I am not responsible for my calendar. Um, I, at least as I've come to understand where I am and how I function as an adult, I say yes to a lot of stuff and I mean it at the time. Um, but then something else comes up something I'm maybe more interested in, something that is worth more of my time, where I've had to physically remove myself from managing my calendar. And I can't tell you what a freeing feeling it is. Um, so Claire and Irish on my team are both the only ones that have access. Like literally I have a, they gave me, we created a special Mongoose Media URL that I could give to my friends because I would have friends I care about or like even my mom. Like they want to book time. Like I'm not allowed to book anything in my calendar. So they made this one secret link so that I could give it to people I love and care about. And they're like, this is the only way you can get in without passing through my gatekeepers, Irish or Claire. <laughs> um, and like, seriously, anyone who's listening to it, if you like, if you can get rid of holding responsibility to your calendar, it frees up a lot of um, anxiety that I would get if like I have to leave somewhere or I need to go. Like I'm someone that like when I show up, I show up. Um, and so sometimes that may mean I'm late to something, but when you have me, you have me. Um, and 
uh, being able to tell someone, um, I, I can't make that commitment because I'm not responsible for my calendar has been a really easy thing for me, um, to default to versus before like, yes, I'll do that. Yes. I'll be there. Hmm. I was very inspired and I've started trying to do that myself as well because I, I have the exact same problem. I say yes to too many things and then it makes me quite anxious seeing my day. Like today I have back-to-back meetings, almost oh, eight no. hours of, of meetings. Um, I, I, I will say, do the same thing. yes, do it for sure, but make sure you break in like a few times. So like at my team at Monks Media, we always like, we'll do a water check. Like, so we have an online um virtual office. It looks like a video game. It's called gather.town. Um, it's free for up to 10. Anyone listening that works in a remote environment and you have a team or you're on a team, it's free up to 10 people. Um, we have a bigger team, so I pay virtual real estate, but we do a water check. Like I always make sure everyone has like a cup of water on them and during meetings we'll check. And so being born with one kidney and being a huge consumer of water all i can recommend is that you uh block out 15 minutes twice a day because eight hours back to back like you'll be doing like the pp dance in your chair yeah i'm gonna have to leave some meetings early and make sure i <laughs> do grab some water as well that yeah. does sound like a important productivity technique as well so apart from that, what else do you do to maintain focus? Is it does is it just easy for you because you are you're doing the things that you enjoy and you delegate the the other stuff? Do you still have to do boring work? Uh yes, I do. I mean, there's always going to be less exciting work to do. Um, my personality is to like when I get excited, I get loud and I get fast and I get like all in. Um. So yeah, no, no, there's definitely like the post notes and um all the things that require, like my husband says that I'm like an alien in this respect. So I have to like get back down the planet earth of um pieces. So what I have found really helpful is uh, I use ClickUp as a project management tool. It's another free one. Um, and there's a timer and um, you can't improve what you don't measure. And, uh, that was the hardest lesson for me of, uh, losing days where I just be like, what happened? I just sat down and it's dark. <laughs> um, so using a time tracker, um, was really important for me. Um, and then also I'd make it transparent. So like my assistant Irish will send me a message every day of everyone's time from yesterday. And everyone has access to it. So you can see like, oh, Lauren only worked three hours yesterday. Like, oh, is that true? Or I just didn't do my time tracking. So I, I really, really recommend time tracking. Um, another, actually another app, this one's free too, that I use in the morning all the time when I'm doing like my 15 minute breakdown, it's called Forest. And what's really great is it's free. And if you plant more trees, it actually gives back to planting seeds around the world as our rainforests continue to diminish. Um, but you can lock your phone. So you can put do not disturb mode, like focus mode. And I can't get any text. I can't get any messages. I can't hear any components. And like that is so game changing for me because I am someone that gets like 200 text messages or lines or cacao talks or WhatsApp a day. Um, plus I have Slack. Plus I have like, I don't even put myself in Google anymore. Irish, I'm not responsible for my calendar and I'm not allowed to go into my email because those just become for me, um, distraction voids. So I can't recommend force enough. I'll actually use it too when I'm working or I'll put a timer for 25 minutes, um, or 45 minutes. I try doing no more than 50, but like 25 and 45 for me. And then I like, I have this timer like going and staring at it. I'm like, I can't leave this task. I did it today for my taxes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, taxes are one of the, the hardest things to, to deal with. How do you, Slack I find is really problematic for me. Do you have any tactics mm. around managing that? Because you probably have multiple Slack workspaces. Oh my gosh, I have, I have more Slack workspaces than I have pink pairs of shoes. And if you know <laughs> me, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so gather.town 
as a place for the remote environment and forcing the team to be in click up our project management tool has reduced, you know, a year ago, I was in Slack six hours a day. And I just, I came to the conclusion. I said, we're not doing this anymore. Um, we set up a comm plan. So Slack is only to be used between me and my assistant directly because that's, she funnels all the emails and she filters them. So she knows that I have only three that I can look at at a time. And until I review one of the three, I can't unlock other emails that she's got on deck. Um, but Slack is not a place to discuss tasks. Like we made that so, so specific that everything is in ClickUp. Like literally, Jimmy, I'm looking at the ClickUp task for recording this podcast where I'm tracking my time and all notes about this podcast are here. So if there's anything that's work related, it has to be discussed on a ClickUp task. And then if there's anything that's like, hey, I just need a quick something that people would traditionally slack, which can be distracting. We have people in different time zones. Sometimes you're working, sometimes you're not. We have our in-person gather.town virtual office. So we're all sitting at our desks. So I use my keyboard and my little avatar walks over to your desk and it starts like a Zoom live conference that I can ring your desk, you pop up. And if it's something that takes less than two minutes, we have a discussion. Anything else, it's all in to click up. And it's been a, a rigorous journey of making sure that's enforced. And I removed uh, bad players from Slack that would not communicate task work inside ClickUp. So they got totally removed, which means they're not on the K-Drama channel where we're talking about which shows are worth watching. <laughs> they're not on the Just for Fun, Just for Laughs. They're not on the Puppy channel. So they're missing out on those non-work conversations. Um, but we like really command it. If it's two minutes or less, you just walk over to their desk. Um, and if it's work related, if it's not in a click of task, it won't get tracked or get done. So now I'm slacking maximum, maximum, um, an hour and a half a day. And that's because Irish and I will be like pounding through some different emails or invoices. I'm interested about the, the way you use gather.town because wouldn't that be distracting mm. as well if someone is walking up to you and doing two minute calls all the time? Good question. So the way that gather.town works is you keep it as a tab that's open, but you're not on the tab. You're working on whatever you are. So because it sits there, if someone comes up to you, you hear the ring and you're like, oh, hey, hey, what's up? But like I'm in my office now, but I'm on do not disturb, which you can do like control you. Oh, so there's okay. three lights. So you have green and I tell everyone green means open office. And like, um, we have like, I'm in a cubicle next to like this groups. There's no like big offices spaces. You can have that. I just found that to be isolating even in the virtual space. Um, but like you can turn off, do not disturb. And we also have a specific area in the office where if you sit at this focus station, it's like, you're, you're telling someone like, I have a deadline, um, like proceed with caution if you need me. Um, but it's just, it's led to so much more collaboration and because everyone's using it, there's a mutual respect versus just constantly going over to someone's desk. I love the focus station idea and being able to signal that. I'm going to have to yeah. check it out. I'll give you a guest pass to my office. You can, <laughs> you can see it's really fun. And we've also used it to, um, like another area that I had a lot of difficulty focusing on. is like, I hire a lot, right? We have a large team. We'll take on new projects. We'll explore new marketing campaigns. And so we'll hire someone. And I would uh, say yes to a lot of candidates that were not worth the time to interview. So we've used gather.town for a very Hunger Games style interview process. If someone passes the first level of interview at, or like the first application, usually it's like a minute video to explain why you'd be a good fit. We invite them to an in-person, in-person virtual interview with a poem and that poem has a riddle that says, you need to be at Interview Island this Friday at 11 a.m. They'll have four days and we won't tell them how to get to Interview Island. Um, but we give them a poem that says, like, essentially, you'll find the map and it's exactly where you think it will be. So they have to, like, walk around the office, find the treasure map that tells them how to get to Interview Island. Because there's a trap door, spoiler alert, for anyone that applies to Mongoose Media and is listening to this podcast. Um that will get you to interview Island. And what we've done is uh, if you show up a second late or your camera and audio are not on, you're automatically DQ'd. So that has been something that has let us set the vibe, um, set the tone and set expectations 
while also clearing up a lot of calendar time. Cause I would be like, Oh, I understand. I'm sorry. You're late or your computer doesn't work. Let's reschedule. I'm like, wait, no, my time is, mm. my time is worth more than that. Do you give them a warning up front to, that set oh, the expectations yeah. or your, we say if you're process. late, yeah. remotely late. And if you're unprepared, as soon as we call on you, like this is a video call. Mm. Um, for any way, shape, or form, you will automatically be asked to uh, leave the office. Mm. And like, we have other things too. Like we might be interviewing four people at once. They have to go sit by the campfire. And because they're sitting in the same space, they can see each other's video camera. Like we are now on Zoom. You can see mm. the other people interviewing for the position. And then you can see the other people in a conversation. Like you can see their virtual stuff. Cause we tried to replicate what worked in person into mm. the virtual space. And like, also there's like sound of the fire, there's sound of the water to give, um, like a stress test, if you will, just mm -hmm. to be like, Hey, agency work can be challenging at times. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that you understand what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really crucial to make sure the recruitment process replicates what it's really like. And it sounds like you're, you're doing that. <laughs> Well, if they survive that, then they come in like, oh, this is way easier. I'm like, <laughs> but right. I will say what's really interesting is if anyone ever adopts this, there are no rules with how they find Interview Island. And we use it because we need to test their tech awareness and their resourcefulness. So they can go ask anyone. And equally, I always invite the team. I'm like, you can go help them. You see these avatars lost in the office. They are trying. Not once has a Mongoose Media PAC member gone out of their way to help a stranger they're like no i had to do this trial by fire <laughs> love it well speaking of water checks we're gonna take a quick break and mm -hmm. i'm gonna have a glass of water hi there focus and chillers are you ready to supercharge your knowledge in the realms of creativity tech and psychology come check out my fortnightly newsletter in each edition you'll get quick wins and actual takeaways that you can put into practice right away if this sounds like you i'd love to have you as a reader subscribe for your fortnightly dose of insights the link is in the show notes and now let's get back to the show all right we're back and we're going to do a rapid fire round now lauren what's one habit you'd like to remove from your life um Hitting play next so quickly on my Netflix button. Yep. <laughs> Common problem. Yeah, I watched I watched so much TV. I'm like, yes, next episode. Play next episode. I'd like to get better at one episode and pacing myself. Maybe you need to have an assistant control your Netflix account. <laughs> That's what my husband says. He's like, my turn. We get to choose what we want to watch. And then he <laughs> falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> How do you switch off at night? Um, I put my phone in a different room. So I like physically need the phone in another room with a door where it's charging because it's too close. Um, I will immediately start working or I'll, I'll keep myself up. Um, the other thing that I do too is so at work, like I always wear earrings when I'm working. That's earrings for when I'm working and I put my hair up when I'm like really focusing on something that like, is important to me. Um, so when I separate from work to non-work, I take off my earrings. Uh, like that's just like my component. And I have friends that'll be like, oh, earrings are off, Lauren. Let's hang out. Um, and then at night, my phone has to go into another room. I, I love that. It's a great hack for working remotely. Yeah. You've mentioned a few apps and other resources do you want to elaborate on any others that might be helpful you mentioned forest and click up what else would you recommend that's been helpful for you um well I, so i'm a voracious reader like goodreads is my favorite social media profile um and libby is my favorite app for books i think a lot of people um uh, want to download a lot of books they're like hey if i buy this book it will solve my problem um, I actually try to avoid buying the books because it, it may sit as like a never ending to-do list staring at me in the face of like, you need to read or watch, listen to this book. Um, but I really like Libby because I can like two to three and a half X or three X, I think is the max an audio so that I can consume uh -huh. it at volume. Um, when I'm, when I'm in the zone, 
and then easily turn it off when I'm not. What's the most recent book that you've read that you've liked or listened to? That, that I like? finished or I've started? Either way. Um, I'm in the middle of a really epic book. Um, it's like 45 hours of an audio. Um, it's a sci-fi fantasy one that I'm like obsessed with. Mm. And um, <laughs> But if your sci-fi is not your jam, uh, for a book club, I'm in two book clubs. And we're re- uh, reading, I'm listening to Where the Deer and the Antelope Play. Um, and then by default of marketing, the, I'm physically reading a book, which he did a really good job um, of making it like picture forward. And I have the hard copy of Alex Hermosi's 100 Million Leads. Um, so those are, I I try really hard to do a nonfiction book one in five because I will, I will consume like my play next of uh, Netflix, but in books are like, young adult trilogies with a love triangle oh my gosh <laughs> do you listen to the the fiction books at three times speed as well oh absolutely oh my gosh I, if you once you go, well it depends if there's an australian accent forgive me or an english accent i have to take it down to 1.75 <laughs> but for the most part like it's hard for me to listen to under a 2 2.5 mm. for books narrated in american english um and if that sounds wild to you, just try it and then listen to one and you're like, are they speaking in molasses? <laughs> yeah, I normally only consume audiobooks while I'm doing other things. I'll go for a mm. run or I'll be doing the dishes. But if I'm listening to it and I'm only listening to it, I'm the same. It has to be at least two times speed. Oh, I oh, I don't find myself only listening to like, yeah, I'll be like walking the dog or I'm multitasking like. I'm I do a lot of it like I'll be watching a foreign a show in a foreign language and be working or I'll be I'll be doing at least two things at once um for stuff that's non-work related like it's so so I I driving especially but I don't know if that counts but mm. I've never like lying down or sitting in a chair just listening to a book mm. I'll yep. clean oh my gosh will I clean <laughs> organize really yeah Love it. All right. Final two questions. Where can people connect with you? Um, my name on all socials is Lauren E. Petrullo, E for Elizabeth or E for extra. If you want to just be like, that is her personality for sure. Um, but yeah, Lauren E. Petrullo on all the socials, or you can connect with me directly on mongoosemedia.us. Do you have any final words or asks for the audience? Um, if you uh, are learning a language or like doing a whole bunch of hobbies, like I'm a super, I'm a serial hobbyist. Um, like, please let me know your favorite one. I you know work in marketing and find that by forcing myself into different environments with um, hobby enthusiasts allows me to open my perspective of the world. So if there's a hobby that you're really into, um, especially if it's not like a super common one, like, please let me know, like, that's my ask. And then, um, what I can provide back is, you know, I have Asian beauty essentials. If you're in the U S or Mexico, um, if you're interested in anything, especially in your evening routine, like I love face masks, um, you get 20% off if you use code focus and chill. Um, uh, but seriously, hit me up with any of those cool hobbies that you're, that I need to try next. Awesome. Mine is biathlon, skiing with a rifle. What? That's a, that's a lot of fun. <laughs> that's might a thing? Yeah. It's probably not possible to do it in Florida, but if you go somewhere in winter where there's snow, it's a very fun spot. <laughs> I've never heard of this. I'm immediately looking up into this right Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thanks a lot. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for everyone that was listening. Ciao. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Focus and Chill podcast. To listen to other episodes, jump onto podcast.focusbear.io. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or you know someone who'd be a good fit, email us at team at focusbear.io. Otherwise, stay focused, stay chilled and peace out.